Hey, hello and welcome. My name is Sam Bellen and I'm a developer advocate at Odd Zero by Okta. Today we're going to have a look at how we can use the device authorization grant to open a remote lock using our phone only. The device authorization grant is often used for applications running on hardware without any input devices like a keyboard, a mouse or a touchscreen. It allows users to use a third-party device like a phone to enter their credentials and log in securely. Think of your favorite streaming application running on your smart TV. There's going to be both a software and a hardware side to this video, but don't worry, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. All the necessary parts you'll need for the hardware side of this video will be listed in the description below. And to get started with the software side, you can also find a GitHub repo linked in the description below. So let's get started with a bit of software. Before we start with writing some actual code, let's first create a free Alt0 account. It's free and easy to do on Alt0.com. If you already have an Alt0 account, you can use your existing account for this. To get started, we'll click on Applications in the left-hand menu and choose Applications. Here we can create a new application. I've already done this, so I'm going to skip this step, but when creating your new application, pay attention to choose a native application type because we need the device authorization grant available for our application. This grant is available for native applications because the grant type often runs on software embedded in pieces of hardware. Note that if you prefer using a command line tool, you can also use the Alzira CLI to create your new application. Once you've done so, you might see a page similar to this one, or you might land on the quick starts page. Be sure to hop on over to the settings tab. The next step is to add an allowed callback URL, allowed login URL, and allowed web origin. I've set mine to localhost port 5173, but be sure to set this to your own application URL. Next up, we'll scroll all the way down and click on Advanced Settings. We'll go to Grant Types and make sure the device grant is enabled. This is an important step. Without the device grant, the project won't work. Once we've, we're done, we'll make sure we save our changes and we're done configuring the Alt Zero tenant for our application. So let's dive into some code. If you go to the GitHub repository linked in the description below and clone it to your computer, you can see that basic scaffolding is already in place together with all the dependencies you'll need to build this project. Be sure to run npm install after you've cloned the repo. If you open up the project in your favorite code editor, you'll see some HTML and CSS. But of course, we'll also need some JavaScript. I've already written this for you and if you'd like to follow along, you can move to the 1-device code git branch. Once we've moved branches, you'll see we now have some code in our main and authentication.js files. In the authentication.js file, you'll find a helper function that helps us deal with URL encoding data. You'll also see a get device code method. This method will request an authorization code from the slash oauth slash device slash code endpoint of our Auth0 tenant. This is the first step in the device authorization grant and our users can use this code to authenticate on their own devices. We'll also request the open ID, profile and email scopes, so we'll also get an ID token at the end of the ride. This will make it easier to show some user information in our application. Let's move to the main.js file. Besides some pointers to some HTML elements, there's also a request code handler function. This will be executed once we click on the login button and then request the codes from our Auth0 tenants. So now, if we open up our application in a browser and click on the login button, we'll see the request to slash OAuth slash device slash code. The response has a few interesting properties. First, a device code, which we'll use later. A user code, which the user can use to verify it's their session they're authenticating on their own device. A timeout, which tells us how long the user has to successfully authenticate on their own device. An interval, which is the interval at which we can pull for a successful authentication session without going over some rate limits. Both timeout and interval are in seconds, not milliseconds. Pay attention to this later. And lastly, a verification URL that the user can open on their device to authenticate. If you choose a complete version of this URL, the user does not even have to enter their user code manually because it's already added to the URL. Mm -hmm. 
Great! We've requested a user and device code and we've created a QR code that the user can scan with their phone to authenticate. Next up, we'll need to poll for a successful authentication session. We'll move to the range 2 poll and see that some extra code has appeared. In our authentication.js file, a second function has appeared that lets us poll for the successful authentication event. It'll do a post request to the slash OAuth slash token endpoint and include the device code we got from the code request earlier, together with the grant type for the device authorization grant. In the main.js file, we'll see a new poll handler function with a set interval that runs at the interval defined on our code request response. Keep in mind that this is returned in seconds and set interval runs in milliseconds, so we'll need to multiply it by 1000. If the polling request returns successfully, that means that the user has authenticated on their device and we can get some tokens back from our auth tenant. If we open up the browser again and click on the login page, we again see that we get a response from the slash code endpoint and we'll see a request every few seconds to the slash token endpoint. Now, if I scan the QR code on screen with my device and log in successfully, the application will stop polling and the successful token request will return with an access token and an ID token. So far, so good. Now that our user can log in, we want to show some information about the authenticated user. Luckily, we requested an ID token, so we can use its content to show some information like their name, email or avatar. If you go to the branch 3-user, you'll see some code that has been added to the poll handler in the main.js file to do exactly this. If we open our browser again and test our application, you'll see your user's information being displayed as soon as you successfully authenticate it on your device. In the beginning of this video, I mentioned we wanted to open a remote lock when successfully authenticating. To do this, the branch 4-connect includes a server.js file that when run on a Raspberry Pi can talk to its GPIO pins to open and close a relay that is attached to a lock. Be aware that this branch will throw some errors when you run its code on a device that's not a Raspberry Pi. If you open up the server.js file, you'll notice that there is an open and close lock endpoint defined that opens and closes a relay connected to the GPIO pin with number 27. I'm using Johnny5 to easily deal with Raspberry Pi GPIO pins and send the right signal to the right hardware like a relay. That's all from the software side. Let's now look at the pieces of hardware we'll need to make this work. We've got our Raspberry Pi. This is a 3B Plus version connected to a touchscreen and connected to a breadboard using a T-style GPIO extension board. Connected to this breadboard, we'll also find a 12 volt solenoid lock and because a Raspberry Pi runs on 5 volts, we'll also have an external 12 volt DC power supply, which you'll see here, which is connected to a DC jack. Connected to this DC jack, you'll also see a relay. This is a dual relay, but we'll only need one for this project. I just had this dual one laying around. And for debugging purposes, I'll also, I've also added two buttons, a little one right here in the middle and another one here close to me. So what is going on? Our 12 volt solenoid lock is connected with the blue wire, the negative wire to the breadboard and then to the negative side of the DC barrel. The positive wire or the plus wire, the red one, is connected to the normally open side of the relay. The positive wire of the DC jack is connected to the middle one, the common side of the relay. And then the relay is connected to both the 5 volt um, of the Raspberry Pi, the ground and pin 27. And this is important because we'll use this pin number to open and close the relay later. So whenever we um, press a button or whenever we complete the device flow on our screen right here, the lock should open. And if I press the button for debugging purposes, you'll see it opens and closes. Whenever I press it in, it opens. When I release it, it closes. And that's it, that's the basics of the hardware. If you want to add these buttons yourself, the Johnny5 documentation has some really good examples on how to add buttons to your project. I'm not going to go in depth because it's not part of this project, since we want to open this lock by using the device authorization grant um, on our device. 